Thank you. So first, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in, in, in this course. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity and, and uh, I, I hope we hope our, our link is very smooth. Um, I, I would like to uh, kind of um, first, the, the purpose of this talk is to begin where uh, my, Michael uh, Ibbotson le <coughs> excuse me, left off and to discuss what happens uh, after signals um, leave the retina and, and thalamus and get uh, to the visual cortex to start um, the initial stages of processing. Um, so the, the, the plan in overview is to, is to talk about, uh, as the title says, the first couple of stages of, of processing in, in visual cortex. Um, in visual areas V1 and V2, to spend most of the time talking about V1, which is the, the initial stage, primary visual cortex, um, to take a little bit of a, <clears throat> excuse me, to take a little bit of a break and to talk about the anatomy uh, of V1 and V2, and that will kind of set us up for some expectations about what might happen in V2, and then to conclude with some some uh, so, uh, with some comments and some some free advice, but I also want. <clears throat> this is a very, very large field, and as, as you probably can guess, it's been heavily studied for well over 50 years, um, and I'm not going to cover everything or even attempt to. Um, so I'm going to try to emphasize some aspects of cortical vision that are not so, in my opinion, not so uh, widely appreciated even within the vision community, and possibly as a, as a result of that, especially not well appreciated in the machine vision community, and might suggest ways in which biological vision and machine vision are different. Um, I'm also gonna focus on things related to form vision. So I'm not gonna say very much at all about color or, uh, or three, you know, stereo vision, three-dimensional vision. I'm really gonna uh, spend most of the time talking about things related to shape. And uh, I, I won't, with kind of, with some regret, I won't even talk about anything that relates to eye movements, which Michael also touched, touched on at the end. Uh, and the, you know the fact that as 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 biological systems that see we move our <clears throat> excuse, <coughs> we we move our eyes and and this is this is critically important so i'm i'm going to neglect the motor aspects of vision as well and and really just focus on what what are the computations that happen uh that relate to the shapes of objects in in the outside world so to get started and to link things up with what you what you've just heard about. Uh, primary visual cortex is, is, is back here at the back of the brain, and it gets its signals as a fo following uh, transformation of visual input into neural signals in the eye and uh, retinal ganglion cells that send those signals to the lateral geniculate nucleus in the thalamus uh, that, you, that you've heard, heard so much about. And then from there, there are fibers that go directly to primary visual cortex. Um, look with this connection from thalamus to cortex in a little bit more detail. The lateral geniculate itself in, in the thalamus has, has many layers, and each of those layers receives inputs from either the right eye or the left eye. And the layers differ in terms of the overall properties of cells. You've heard about the, pac the, the parvocellular neurons and the magnocellular neurons, and those occupy different layers. And there's some minor layers in between uh, uh, that, that have the, the coniocellular pathways. And in humans, this structure has six major layers and six and, and six minor layers. The neurons whose cell bodies are in the lateral geniculate have go uh, traverse the uh, optic radiations, as, the, as this pathway is called, uh, and and then provide input to to primary visual cortex. And as the diagram shows, primary visual, cor visual cortex has many many layers, but only a couple of the layers, layer four C and some of the other parts of layer four are primarily the input layers. So uh, one thing that we need to bear in mind is primary visual cortex is not a unitary thing. It has multiple layers and we should expect that cell properties will differ. And one of those differences is that the input layers receive input from only one eye or the other eye and signals then mix uh, throughout these layers so that, la that neurons in, the, in, in all the other layers get their inputs indirectly from the eye, namely just from other synapses within the visual cortex, and consequently, they they uh, have signals from from both eyes, both eyes together. Um, uh, now, this is primary visual cortex, 
that's only one of many, many stages. And this is a, a classic exploded view of uh, the visual areas of, of the monkey brain, illustrating that primary visual cortex here is one of about, uh, depending on how you count, about 40 visual areas. I'll say something about area V2, which is this part, which, where signals from V1 uh, go next. Um, but as, as this diagram suggests, there's an awful lot of complexity in many, many stages of processing uh, beyond V1 and V2 that I won't even say anything about. Um, one other point I want to make while, while we're looking at this is, you know, I'm, I've already started to describe the system as if it is kind of a bucket brigade. The signals go from retina to thalamus to V1 to V2. Uh, but one of the most important and relatively unappreciated aspects of, of the visual system is that wherever there are feed forward signals, there are also feedback signals. And the feedback signals are just as numerous and just as potent as the feed forward signals. So it's not a serial passage, it's really feed forward and feedback at, at every stage. Um, so you know, I have no choice but to describe things in an order, but one should remember that processing occurs both forwards, both forwards and backwards. So uh, the, the interest in and kind of the whole way in which visual cortex was studied, at least for a couple of decades, began with uh, the, the Nobel Prize winning observations of Hubel and, 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 and Wiesel in 1962, who identified a, an incredibly salient difference between the way neurons respond to visual stimuli in the thalamus, in the lateral geniculate, and the way they do in cortex. So they used a very simple technique called hand mapping, and they presented spots of light. Let's leave this. They presented spots of light to, um, uh, to, an, to an animal and recorded from neurons and found that, um, as, as, uh, as you heard, that neurons in the thalamus have a receptive field, have an area of space that they care about that's organized in a circular fashion. And some of those neurons will respond with an increased firing rate when you, you present light in the center uh, and, an increased, and an increased firing rate when, when you remove light from the surround. So those are cells that respond to light that goes on in the center and off in the surround. Uh, and there are other cells that respond when light goes off in the center and on in the surround. But in either case, these cells are roughly organized in a circular fashion so that it doesn't matter what direction from the center the light is in, it's just center versus surround. So they're kind of local, so they detect local changes in light uh, that, some, that there's a bit more light in the center than in the surrounding area or a bit less light in the center than in the surrounding area. So when they applied the same mapping technique to neurons and primary visual cortex, they found something which is dramatically different. Uh, what, they, what they found was that there were that the typical neurons had a also had areas in which they responded to light on and light off, but instead of those areas being organized in a circular fashion, they were organized in this oriented fashion, so that there would be a bar-shaped region in which a cell would respond to light on, and in the flanks it would respond to light off, and so so the, the in a way the best stimulus for the cell would be a bright bar in this particular position. Now other cells responded to a dark bar or withdrawal of light in an oriented region and, and uh, to the presentation of light in the flanking regions. And in, in some cases, uh, they respond, the flanking regions were on both sides of the central region. In other cases, it was predominantly on one side or the other, as you see here. But, but the, the, the cardinal feature of all of these neurons is that they cared about the orientation of an edge between brightness and darkness, or the orientation of a bar, not just the presence of a bar independent of orientation. So this orientation selectivity uh, is, is famously became the sort of the cardinal distinguishing feature of how neurons respond in visual cortex versus how they respond to just one synapse downstream in the thalamus. And under, and uh, not, not only is this considered a, a uh, major, you know, functionally important aspect of visual cortex, but it attracted a great deal of attention to understand how, how this kind of oriented response could come about. Um, the, the, the initial hypothesis for this, which uh, Hubel and Wiesel presented at the time that they made these observations, was that this, this orientation tuning came about as a result of 
a special alignment of the connectivity that neurons in the thalamus have these circular symmetric, circularly symmetric receptive fields, and their connectivity to neurons in visual cortex is such that a neuron in visual cortex would receive inputs from a bunch of cells in the thalamus that were appropriately aligned, so that when a light contour was uh, oriented along this alignment, then this, the V1 neuron would respond uh, in, in a, in a robust way, and it wouldn't respond very much when the light was, was in some, some oblique direction. So this was a hypothesis, uh, but this hypothesis gained a lot of support from experimental evidence. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the, the methodology used here, but via a uh, much more precise method than hand mapping, one could map the inputs to a neuron in the thalamus uh, and find areas in, and, and mark in, and indicate in red parts of this of space in which that cell um, responded to light onset and, and mark in blue parts in space in which the cell responded to light offset. And at the same time, so this was an incredibly difficult experiment, record from a neuron in primary visual cortex that was connected to that neuron. And what one found was that the receptive fields of the thalamic neuron made up part of the receptive fields of the V1 neuron, exactly as predicted by this connectivity model. So, the, so here we have a, a kind of a very simple idea that you can build cells that have orientation selectivity by putting together and superimposing the inputs from cells that don't have orientation selectivity, as long as, long as you do it in, 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 in sort of a spatially correct way. Um, now, we'll, we'll, we'll see in a few minutes that this is, uh, um, this is, although this is correct, this is only a very small portion of, of what is actually correct. But nevertheless, this is the first idea of how one could build uh, neurons with uh, more interesting spatial selectivity than what one saw in the thalamus. It brings up the question about what is the nature of these synaptic inputs? And uh, so, so um, let me show you another uh, very classic a set of experiments that indicated uh, sort of the, the, the physiology of this, of this connectivity from, from thalamus to, to visual cortex. So the experiment began with the same kind of mapping of a visual cortical neuron into regions in which turning light on made the cell fire more and turning light off uh, made the cell fire less. Um, but instead of just recording the spikes of the cells, the, 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 the action potentials, um, uh, uh, Her Hirsch and colleagues had electrodes inside the cell so they could record the synaptic signals. And so, so when light went on, they saw, they saw as expected there would be spikes and the cell would depolarize. But now in this, and they called this a, a, a push response, that the thalamus was pushing the cell to respond. But then they could do the, the experiment of turning light off in, in this region in which the cell responds well when light goes on. So when it turns light off, of course, the cell wouldn't fire, which is what you see here. But in addition, the cell became hyperpolarized. The cell received inhibitory inputs that didn't result in a change in firing, but did result in a change in membrane potential. So it resulted in essentially making it harder for that cell to fire in a way intracellular, uh, so intracellular signals that prevented firing um, or caused by presenting light of the wrong polarity in, in, this, uh, in this on region. And so they called this a pull because it pulled the cell away from firing. Now, conversely, one could present, one could turn light off in, in, the, in the off region and one found a push, and one could turn light on in the off region and we could find the pull. So that there was this combination, not only were cells correctly connected from the thalamus to align with the spatial tuning of the neuron, but on cells and off cells uh, had their signals integrated by, by the cortical neuron so that they properly pushed and pulled the cell to reinforce this, this on and off behavior. So um, from kind of a mathematical point of view, one now wondered whether one could simply, one could think of a cortical neuron as something that took inputs across space and added and subtracted them according to where that input came from. Um, namely, could one simply think of the cell as a way of, of applying a linear operation to the spatial pattern of light? Um, so that actually, that idea could then lead to, exper 
you know, that mathematical idea can be turned into experiments that one can use to test it. So the basic strategy, uh, and, and I'll just kind of talk about this in a, in, in a slightly abstract way so that it applies to lots of different experiments, is that you first decide what you're going to use as your, as your collection of stimuli. Will you use stimuli that vary in one spatial dimension or a spatial dimension in time or two spatial dimensions in time? But you choose a, a vector space of possible stimuli. You then choose some basis set within that space. So spots or lines or bars or sinusoids, uh, but you choose some set of vectors that, that, that span that space. Now you can uh, record the responses to each of those basis elements. Um, and, and we can use those, those responses as essentially the, the coefficients by which those, the, those basis vectors are weighted by the neuron. If this linear picture is correct, then you now have a, a uh, measurement of how the, response, how the neuron responds to every basis element in the space. So you should be able to predict how the cell responds to anything in the space. Now you, now you just do a test. You present some stimuli that you didn't use uh, for the regression, and you see whether you can correctly predict the response. So this, you know, this is kind of a, a way of trying to put your money where your mouth is. Uh, about whether a, a neuron really can be regarded as a, as a linear filter of its input, uh, as was suggested by the first few slides. So there are a couple of experiments that, that suggested that this is really kind of on the right track. And he, here's, here's, a, here's a summary of that. In, step, in, in part one of the experiment, uh, uh, Marcel Jo looked at the response of the neuron to bars. And so that's a basis set, and it should predict the response to sinusoids and see Fourier transformation. So he measured the responses to bars, he Fourier transformed them, and predicted the response to sinusoids across different spatial frequencies, and made the measurements and found a very good match. Um, so, um, so supporting the idea that one could think of neurons as, as linear filters. Um, here, here's this was kind of a, a real important thing. So it was so it wasn't just one experiment. Um, and, and so here's another kind of a different test, maybe a bit more qualitative, but in a way more, more impressive. Um, one starts with the idea that you could, uh, that neurons, as, as I've been emphasizing, have a tuning to orientation. So, uh, but you could imagine measuring their orientation to bars and also measuring their, their orientation tuning for checkerboards. What's interesting about this is if you look at the Fourier decomposition of a set of bars, all the spatial frequencies are in a single axis. If you look at the Fourier decomposition of a checkerboard, the Fourier components lie in, all two, in, in, in both dimensions. And interestingly, the strongest Fourier component for a checkerboard is on a 45 degree angle to each of the edges. So if this idea of uh, neurons responding as as, as linear filters that care about particular spatial frequencies is correct, then a cell that responds best to a grating in this orientation will respond best to a checkerboard that's rotated by 45 degrees so that its dominant spatial frequency component is now aligned with its orientation tuning, uh, which is to say that if this sort of linear picture is correct, it's not the edges that drive the cells, it's the dominant Fourier component, and the dominant Fourier component for a checkerboard means that the edges have to be rotated by 45 degrees. So that's the prediction, and this is the experiment. And as you can see, the, the dominant orientation for a checkerboard is indeed rotated by 45 degrees with respect to a, to a grating. So uh, this is kind of a counterintuitive prediction, uh, and a, but you know, it's, it's, it's a qualitative prediction, but it's, it's, it's one that the, uh, the linear filter um, the linear filter picture um, make, makes very naturally. So there was a so at this period of time, um, and to some extent still now, uh, the notion that one could regard cortical neurons as as linear filters was kind of uh, dominated the field. So uh, where we are at this point is that we have physiologic evidence of receptive fields being formed by adding up uh, inputs from the thalamus and that tuning profiles uh, that are kind of uh, Gabor functions uh, will account for many aspects of their responses. Um, 
but there are a lot of things that we haven't um, grappled with. And what is, one is um, response time course. Uh, one is, um, you know, uh, the fact that cortical circuitry is actually quite complicated and we only, and this, this picture of uh, linear summation makes sense if you're talking about the thalamic inputs to uh, the input layer, but it doesn't make much sense beyond that. But even in the input layers, most of the inputs to a cortical neuron are from other cortical neurons, not from the thalamus. So this idea that the thalamic, thalamic inputs drive the cortical responses um, almost seems accidental. Uh, that yes, we got the right responses, but what does that have to do with mechanism? Because it only accounts for what less than 10% of the inputs are doing. And and you know and uh, you know the world isn't made out of gratings and checkerboards. Um, we need to account for how neurons respond to more complicated things. So that um, that sets us up for the next um, the next phase of the analysis. So for, first, thinking about dynamics, and and here's some some work from Sagar. I don't I don't know whether he he showed this, but uh, it, 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 it's beautiful work. The, base, the basic finding is that if you, again, now recording from neurons with electrodes inside neurons, you can see the, the effects of signals even before, before uh, spiking occurs. One sees that the orientation tuning, which is shown in each of these graphs, is not a fixed function of time. So it develops over time. In this neuron, it's, it's maximally sharp. Uh, it, it, it's maximally So we lost your voice. Are you there? Oh, so, sorry, sir. You need you need to uh, start about two to three minutes. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I I apologize. Did, did, um, yeah, I, re I remember the slide. You... Oh, oh, did, had had we talked about this slide? You need to share the slide. Okay. Uh, yes. Sorry. Um, have, have we, did we, did, uh, did we, where did we lose the connection? Yes, yes, yes. Come down. Did we see this? Did we talk about this slide? No, 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 the next one. Diverse dynamics. Okay, it, it, that, that's where we lost the connection? Yeah, well, one minute, I'll just uh, reconfirm. Yes, sir. you can start from here, sir. Okay, so I apologize for the connection problem. Um, so the main point I wanted, to, I, I wanted to make from this slide 
uh, was that e each of these rows shows how a single cortical neuron's orientation tuning evolves over time. And one, first one can see lots of different patterns, but the most important thing is that orientation tuning does evolve over time. In some cells, as in the top row, it sharpens. In, in this cell, it goes from essentially untuned to very sharp. In the cell in the bottom row, it, it, it sharpens and then, and then the orientation tuning broadens again. And this is not something that you would expect if orientation tuning was determined by, um, by a fixed hardwired set of inputs from, from the thalamus whose alignment determined the orientation tuning. Um, look, the kind of remembering the visual cortex has many layers. One can also look at how this pattern of orientation tuning varies across layers. And one can, one, one can see that, uh, that in each layer, there's a, a wide range of orientation tuning. The input layers, um, the input layers, which is here, uh, don't necessarily have the sharpest orientation tuning. Some of the sharpest orientation tuned cells are beyond the input layers. And this in turn suggests that orientation tuning not only evolves over time, but depends in part on, on, on cortical circuitry, not just the inputs uh, to lay, uh, um, which, which come primarily into, uh, into layer 4C. As a, as a very quick overview to um, what these layers actually do, some of these layers are primarily input layers, some of them are intrinsic uh, connectivity layers, and, and other layers are outputs either to other visual cortical areas or, or, back, down, or back down to the thalamus. Um, so just as another way of emphasizing that orientation tuning depends both on time and on layer, uh, here's, here's a map of how orientation tuning evolves over time for, for example, neurons in lots of different layers. And again, one can see sharpening and then, and then uh, one can not only see sharpening over time, but one can see sharpening over time followed by, uh, followed actually by inhibition at the same dominant orientation. So, so uh, although the, the idea of, of, so that although it's true that thalamic input to visual cortex is oriented and that that establishes the orientation tuning of some neurons, that's very, very far from the complete picture um, because, because it doesn't account for variability and it doesn't account for evolution over, over time or changes across cortical layers. Um, uh, this, you know, so one is in, instead driven to look at other potential mechanisms for orientation tuning in addition to the standard view of, of convergence of excitatory activity. So that's one. But there are many other ways of developing orientation tuning. You could have excitatory and inhibitory fields that interact. One could have, uh, one could have antagonistic signals from, from, thalamic, from thalamic inputs that are biased in different directions. And most importantly, one can have intracortical interactions between neurons that have some orientation tuning and, and neurons that have either similar or different orientation tunings that, that you can interact with um, in excitatory and inhibitory fashion. So um, the idea that, uh, that recurrent excitation is responsible for amplifying a low level of orientation tuning that's produced by the thalamic input has gained, gained a lot of currency. And just kind of summarizing that idea with this overall state diagram uh, from a review article uh, from Shafty and Sampolinsky, um, actually even already 20, more than 20 years ago. So uh, the, the idea, so bottom line here is that orientation tuning is a, is a cardinal feature of cortical, of, of cortical function, but the way that it gets there uh, is, is likely due to uh, a complex pattern of, of recurrent interactions within the visual cortex. So at this point, I've, I've only talked about what are called simple cells and, um, and we, to summarize, we have uh, a picture of spatial and temporal diversity and multiple mechanisms of, of orientation tuning. But we, we haven't even considered what's kind of the, big, the biggest problem, which is that all of this discusses neurons in the, in, sort of in the, um, through the lens of thinking of them as being linear, when in reality there are some major qualitative uh, and dramatic nonlinearities that, 
that make this whole picture uh, kind of more like the tip of the iceberg than the full story. And the, uh, the presence of major nonlinearities uh, was, was also noted at the time that Hubel and Wiesel identified the properties of simple cells. And they called cells that had this other kind of behavior complex cells. Um, and uh, so now we're going to talk a bit about, about them. Um, uh, I should also mention at the outset that it's probably it's, the idea that there are really two rigid categories, simple and complex, is, is probably not going to not the best way to think about things, but it's a good way to organ it's a good way to organize the material and, and it at least allows one to feel that one is making progress. Um, so here's here's uh, uh, one of the original recordings of a, a quote complex cell. So what the diagram on the left is showing is is a region of space and uh, Hubel and Wiesel presented a bar in a particular region of space at the orientation that the cell pre preferred. And as we expect, the cell responded with a burst of spikes when the bar was presented. But the cell also responded with a burst of spikes when the bar was withdrawn. So rather than the sort of the behavior of a sim of, that we'd expect from a simple cell, in which if a stimulus does something, then removal of the stimulus does the opposite. And again, this is what you'd expect for linear behavior. Presentation of a stimulus does something, and removal of the same stimulus does the same thing. So this is exactly not what you would expect for from a cell that had approximately linear behavior. To make matters worse, if you take the same bar and present it in different parts of space, rather than finding on and off regions, one found that whatever it did in one part of space, it also did in other parts of space. So for example, here, when the bar is presented, the cell fired, and when the bar is withdrawn, the cell also fired. And here, when the bar is presented, the cell fired, and when it's withdrawn, the cell also fired. So it doesn't have on and off regions, and, and whatever it does in one region, it does the same when you withdraw a stimulus from that region. So Hubel and Wiesel uh, um, proposed that you can make these cells by taking simple cells and, putting, and, and adding their inputs across a range of space. So this accounts for the fact that no matter where you put the bar, you get the same response, but of course it only, it, it, it can't account for the fact that presentation of, this, of the bar and presentation and withdrawal of the bar does the same thing because that would assume that the inputs just add up. So it may be that this is the right kind of connectivity, but we still have to understand how it is that the inputs interact so that you get the same response to presentation and withdrawal of the same of, of a particular stimulus. So this kind of nonlinearity is, this is one kind of nonlinearity that one can see just by presentation and withdrawal of, of individual bars. Uh, it turns out that if you sort of do slightly more complicated experiments that you see even more nonlinearities. So for example, uh, there's a famous nonlinearity known as end stopping. So in this, this cell responds to a presentation of a bar or actually movement of a bar in this part of space. When you extend the bar, it responds less. And what was what makes this a nonlinearity is that presenting the bar, the pieces of the bar in just these flanking regions of space does nothing. So we have a stimulus that does something. We extend the bar into a region of space that the cell doesn't seem to care about, and it suppresses the response. So, uh, so this is um, one example of a much more general phenomenon that presentation of the components of the scene outside of the receptive field can modulate the response. And, and you know, so again, formally, this is a nonlinearity. Um, motion uh, presents other opportunities to decide whether cells are behaving linearly or not. And we again start with a classic recording of Hubel and Wiesel uh, that show that cells respond best to motion in a particular orientation. Um, but now if you try to, you can think of motion as a superposition of bars presented at different locations at different times. So it's thinking of it as kind of a, a, a freeze frame movie, uh, that a moving bar is a superposition of, of brief presentations of bars at different positions. So one can ask whether you can account for the response to a moving stimulus by putting together sums of responses to little pieces of, of motion at different places and different times. So one can measure those individual responses and one can then directly measure the two bar interactions 
and one finds that the two-bar interactions are, are substantial. So we have a problem that neurons are quite nonlinear, and, and to try to uh, uh, capture the computations that they do, we need, we need a somewhat better or somewhat more um, elaborate mathematical structure than, than, uh, than linear systems analysis. Uh, but we'd like to build on the basic idea of regression. So just kind of to summarize what we were saying, that if the neuron were linear, we would choose a stimulus space. We would choose a set of basis functions for it. We could measure the neural response by regressing the response against each, each of these basis elements uh, by doing an experiment. And then uh, we find uh, by kind of reinterpreting these, these experiments that I just showed, that the regression model will fail at their interactions. So what do we do? Uh, what we can do is we can regress the response, not just against the stimulus, but against all pairs of stimuli and all triplets of stimuli, et cetera. And, and then we can um, take these responses and uh, apply a standard procedure known as, uh, uh, well, we, could, we can orthogonalize and, and what results is uh, after a bit of kind of rearranging things, uh, the, the, the Wiener kernel representation of, of the response of an arbitrary system, not necessarily a linear one. So it's a nice formal, uh, it's a nice formal approach to analyze nonlinear input-output relations. Um, the problem is, or there are a couple of problems, and maybe these are kind of immediately obvious. One is that you get this kind of ugly expansion which has which can't really have much to do with biology and doesn't really think that neurons work as, as, as functional Taylor series. Um, second problem, that if you try to do experiments, you find that the number of measurements that you have to make uh, is, is far too great to be practical in a, in a real experiment. So what was done for a fairly long period of time was to take the Wiener approach and to simplify it a bit and to, uh, to simple, to, you, to modify it so that instead one was fitting somewhat simpler models that didn't have this, this same degree of generality, but one could still use the Wiener formalism to determine the parameters of, of let's say, a linear filter, a, piece, a pointwise nonlinearity, and, and perhaps a second linear filter, and attempt to account for neural, neural responses uh, via, via pathways such as this, or perhaps parallel combinations of pathways such as this, or even simpler pathways that that lacked this, this second linear element. So this, uh, this approach of taking linear systems analysis, fully generalizing it, and then reducing it to something which is more manageable uh, is, is a good framework for trying to understand nonlinear, nonlinear neurons. Um, so for example, what happens is that one can take a movie, which is random in space and time, and measure neuron responses. We can regress, namely cross-correlate the response to each of the stimuli and to each of the pairs of stimuli, and, and, and then uh, sort of carry out the Wiener procedure and identify filter followed by nonlinearity models that could attempt to explain the response. Um, and then one can do this with, with parallel combinations of the model in, in, in much the same way. Um, obviously, this is, this is um, Merely intended to be a conceptual overview, not 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 a complete description of the procedure. Um, but the basic idea is to say that yes, we you know th there there is a formal way of trying to model uh, neural responses that we can actually apply to uh, to physiologic experiments. So when Rust and colleagues uh, applied this to V1 neurons, um, they they were able to extract filters that accounted for the responses to uh, spatiotemporal noise and. Uh, for simple cells, um, e even for quote simple cells, they required some nonlinear components, and for complex cells, they required a lot more nonlinear components. But this idea that simple cells, even simple cells, were somewhat nonlinear, and complex cells were, were more nonlinear, was a uh, was initial glimpse of the possibility that maybe simple and complex are not actually dichotomous classes, but but just two ends of the continuum. Um, Another thing I want to emphasize is that this is a mo this this kind of a modeling approach, which is which is very useful if you want to understand what are the computations. It focuses on the input-output relationship, but it doesn't. It's not a an attempt to look at 
what is the underlying circuitry that creates it. It's just a matter of can we reproduce the input out and hit respond. Of course, that's great if what you want to do is try to capture it from machine vision, because you might not want to copy the hardware at a very detailed level. But still, the question is, you know, we've, we've now fit responses to spatial temporal noise. Can we use that to account for responses to two-dimensional pattern? Um, and can we do this, and, and even if not quantitatively, can we at least do it qualitatively? So our, our lab took, an, took another approach, and, and, and um, let's say we, we looked at this model class, and we asked, are there properties that this model class has that, uh, that, that don't depend on exactly what kind of um, uh, uh, set of basis functions you use to, to analyze it? And, and that led us to an approach, which I want to spend a couple of minutes about, in which we, we developed a, an interesting set of basis functions, Hermite functions, um, that could be used to uh, analyze receptive fields and ask whether this, whether this linear followed by nonlinear filter model um, even has a chance of being right. Um, so the idea is that these are patterns of increasing spatial complexity in two dimensions, uh, and they, they naturally form a series of, they naturally come in a series of, of ranks. Um, and here you see these basis functions presented as a function of x times a function of y um, times a two-dimensional Gaussian. What's interesting about these basis functions is that uh, you can also reorganize them into radially symmetric functions that, so that each of the functions in each row are linear combinations of functions in the polar row and vice versa. So, so these guys are linear combinations of, of the ones on the right. The ones on the right are linear combinations of the ones on the left. Each of these is then basis functions that one can use to uh, uh, either do a linear systems procedure or, or a Wiener-like procedure. Um, and each one, the span of, they have the same span and they have the same overall contrast. So one would expect that neurons that have some kind of a gain control, uh, that, that gain control would be neutralized uh, across these two sets. So our, our idea was to use these two different basis sets, which have very different visual appearances, to map the filter functions, the, the, the effective filter functions of neurons, with the idea that we should get the same results if the whole idea of, of filter followed by nonlinearities is even approximately right. Um, so our model framework was that neurons had a linear component and they had an on-off component, and that we could extract each of these by, by reverse correlating against these, these, these Hermite functions uh, as, as, as diagrammed here. So you can do that, um, and, and we can determine the, the effective filters with the Cartesian basis set, and not so surprisingly, we get some kind of an oriented filter um, uh, that's, that's kind of, that's Gabor-like. And then we can do the same thing with a polar basis set, which has the same span, and we find for this cell, as well as for many other cells, that Yes, there is a Gabor-like filter function, but it has a different apparent orientation. So the, the kind of unavoidable conclusion is that the uh, apparent orientation of a cell depends very much on context and is not something that one can capture in a, in a, uh, in a, in a feed-forward fashion. So uh, just to sort of summarize what we found across the population, so this was 70 neurons in, in the macaque monkey. Um, for only a quarter of them, did we find that the, that the filter, the, the linear uh, uh, nonlinear cascade model would, would, had a hope. For three quarters of the cells, the filter function that we extracted either differed in orientation or size or magnitude or both, um, depending on whether we used, um, depending on whether we use the Cartesian or the, or the um, or depending on whether we use the Cartesian or, or, or the polar functions. So just to kind of summarize where we are, um, we started out with the idea that V1 uh, could be viewed as a bank of oriented filters. Um, we, we recognized that we needed to pay a lot more attention to dynamics and that the circuitry was at odds with this, that uh, nearly, all of the, um, nearly all of the inputs to a typical visual neuron don't come from the pounds, but come from other cortical neurons. And possibly as, as a result of uh, not paying too much attention to the anatomy, we found that the idea of a, of a feed-forward model doesn't really account for responses of, neur 
it, you know, it ex explains some things, uh, such as the, the, the checkerboard tuning, but it doesn't account for the, the, the overall uh, pattern of responses of neurons to, to two-dimensional spatial patterns. So I want to spend a little bit more time on the consequences of the, uh, of the fact that uh, visual cortex is massively recurrent and that only a small number of, of synapses come from the lateral geniculate, because this, this will take us, uh, this will at least provide another window on the whole simple complex uh, uh, dichotomy. So uh, this is also cla classical work uh, uh, of Chance et al. And what they, what they did was they took a very simple model of, uh, of, of a toy cortex that had inputs that were oriented filters, but also had massive recurrence. And what they found, what, what, what they found was, was that if you change the amount of recurrence, you could change behavior from being simple-like, so response to something and then empty response to its withdrawal, to, to, to behavior that was complex-like. So with, with a lot of recurrence one, uh, between cells, one could get responses that were the same for the presentation of a stimulus and also for, for its withdrawal. So what this means was that, that the same network, just by tweaking the amount of recurrence, could have simple behavior or it could have complex behavior. And that if they randomly assigned neurons to having lots of, lots of recurrence, uh, as in this case, or very little recurrence, they could reproduce the apparent dichotomy between simple and complex cells that was, that was previously observed. So the idea here is that if you take a massively recurrent circuit and just tickle it with a little bit of oriented input, then, then you can account for why you have some uh, linear-ish neurons and some highly nonlinear neurons, and even an apparent dichotomy between uh, linear-like neurons and, and complex neurons. This idea was then extended uh, much more recently uh, into kind of a full-bodied full, full, full model with neurons with different orientation tunings in a spatial pattern like that of visual cortex. And the striking result was that not only could one reproduce this, the, the, the dichotomy between simple and complex cells, but one could also reproduce the, ver the range of, of tuning and, and diversity of tuning within and across cortical layers. Um, uh, I should mention that this is, this, is, this is a lot of progress. It's not as far as saying that one could reproduce the response to two-dimensional stimuli in general, but one could at least reproduce dynamics and diversity of, of, of the grading tuning responses. So let me, let me just summarize where we, where we are at this point. So we have a quite, so to summarize what we think we know about V1, um, uh, at a level of an approximate linear description, filters uh, that are local in space and spatial frequency, i.e. Gabor functions, um, there is uh, tuning results not just from cortical input, but largely from intrinsic V1 circuitry. Uh, and there is uh, major diversity in, in the extent of tuning, in the spatial frequency tuning, in dynamics, and to what extent cells are linear versus nonlinear. The, the feedforward models account for responses to bars and gratings, but, but not much more. And recurrent models, although they don't yet account for responses to two-dimensional stimuli, they at least account for the at least account for the diversity. So, uh, yeah. So at this point, I want to um, I want to sort of take the a little bit of a non-mathematical break into anatomy, uh, and this will set up uh, what we might expect to find in in, in V two. Um, uh, would it be a good idea just to, to pause for questions at this point? Hello? Hello? Yes, sir. No, I just want, wondering whether it be, I, I might, this might be a good time to point, pause for questions. Uh, or I could just yes, they'll, they'll, they'll be passing it on. Sorry, they'll be passing on the mic, sir. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, I, I, should I proceed? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to proceed. I just thought this was a, a good break. Hello, uh, ICSR, ICSR, are there any questions? Please respond. Uh, so you can proceed, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank go you, back on the air. Yep. Okay, so so I wanted to just talk a little bit about another aspect of of uh, sort of another kind of window on early cortical processing uh, from the anatomical viewpoint. Um, so we're going to take a bit bit of a break from the math um, and and go back to again one of the earliest observations of, of visual cortical physiology from from the work of Hubel and Wiesel. So, what, so their recordings were done by passing an electrode gradually through the brain and recording the properties of every neuron as, uh, of, of each neuron that they, that they could reliably isolate as they, as they encountered it. And what they found was that, these, that orientation tuning varied smoothly along a trajectory through the brain, as well as the position of the response in the receptive field. Uh, so you have this kind of problem or, or this, this interesting aspect that space is being mapped onto primary visual cortex and orientation is also being mapped onto primary visual cortex, both in a, in a somewhat smooth way. Um, and this interplay turned out to be quite interesting. Um, one can emphasize the mapping of space by another sort of experiment. And this is, this is an, an early form of, 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 of a kind of experiment that can now be done in many, many ways. And, and, and in, in a way much more efficiently. But the, the idea was to map a pattern of activation by visual stimuli in space into a metabolic pattern of activation on a section of primary cortex. And this dramatically shows how, a, how space in the real world is mapped onto space on cortex. Um, it also shows that the center of gaze, the, the area around the, the fovea, as, as, as Michael was mentioning, uh, that we have our best vision, uh, gets an exp a disproportionately expanded area of primary visual cortex. But the main thing I want to emphasize here is that space is mapped smoothly onto space, and this has to go hand in hand with orientation changing continuously as you move uh, within cortex. So putting these things together led to what was known as the ice cube model, that, uh, that on, a, on a coarse scale, space is mapped onto space, and then on a fine scale in these subunits called cortical columns or hypercolumns, orientation gra changes, changes gradually. This was an inference that was made from these, from repeated microelectrode penetration plaques, um, but then was confirmed by very elegant methods in, uh, involving different approaches to optical imaging that showed, that showed two things. First, that orientation, here's indicated as color, varied smoothly across space. And second, that in each kind, there, 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 these modules that contained each orientation also contained inputs from each eye. So locally, there's sort of a, there's a, a cortical unit that contains inputs from both eyes and all orientations. And then as you move from unit to unit, you move across space. Um, so here's a way of mapping visual space on a coarse scale and eye input and orientation on a fine scale um, to the, uh, into visual cortex. Um, not just orientation, but also the dominant spatial frequency very smoothly um, and, um, and color. So there are port parts of their neurons that tend to be more selective for color and less selective for color. And they also map in a systematic way, forming these color blobs, one in each of these um, in one, in one in each of these hyper columns, and they tend to little, and they tend to, they tend to be at the centers of these orientation orientation pinwheels. So we have uh, a mapping of of space. We have a mapping of orientation. We have a mapping of spatial frequency. We have a mapping of of color and and ocular dominance. Um, and 
to a large extent, these, these maps are independent. And, and here's a very modern technique uh, involving two photon imaging that allows uh, registration of activity of individual neurons. Uh, and one can see that these different maps to a large extent are all, are, are, are all independent. And, and not only that, that, that even within a cortical, even within one of these domains, there is a, re, there's relative preservation of the spatial mapping of the outside world. So there's, there's this really beautiful structure of mapping of space and color and orientation and ocular dominance onto primary visual cortex. Um, and, and it's kind of hard to imagine that this doesn't have anything at all to do with its function. Um, when one goes to, from V1 to V2, uh, the changes are really very dramatic. Here are the ocular dominance columns in V1. In, so, uh, so neurons that respond to one eye are form these light stripes and neurons that respond to, to the other eye pre predominantly form these dark stripes. But at the border between primary visual cortex and, and secondary visual cortex, the, 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 these, uh, these domains simply go away. Um, another big difference is that uh, I, I mentioned that there are neurons that tend to be more selective for color. Uh, one can image them with a, a, a technique called cytochrome oxidase uh, activity and see that they form these little blobs. Each of these, each of these blobs in V1 is at the center of, 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 of a hypercolumn that takes care of a particular portion of space. And when one crosses the V1 to V2 border, the blobs go away, and instead you have this pattern of, of thick stripes and thin stripes. Um, and the thick stripes and thin stripes overall have, uh, have, uh, di have distinct physiologic properties. So it looks like, um, from the anatomy, that there's this dramatic difference between what's happening in V1 and V2. And uh, this motivates us to ask physiologically, what is the difference in computations? Now, the problem is that we don't yet, as I'm trying to emphasize, have a great model for what happens in V1. So, uh, so if we don't have a great model for V1, it's going to make it a little bit hard to uh, kind of have a great theoretical framework for asking, how is V2 any different? Um, so without a theoretical framework, we're still not really, you know, we, ha we still have something that we can do. We can basically choose some set of stimuli and look at how neurons in V1 respond and look at how neurons in V2 respond. And we can do this with stimuli that we choose because they're kind of mathematically convenient, or we can choose them because we think they're, they're biologically important or because, they, because we have some intuition about them or, or for some other reason. But uh, so what I'm going to talk about now is several, several ways of attempting to characterize V1 with the class of stimuli that one can then take to V2 and ask, well, what are the differences? Um, and one, one, of the, one of the nicer examples of this uh, is, is work from Jack Galant's lab. So he used a basis set that he called Berkeley wavelets, which are patterns that are localized in space and localized in frequency, in spatial frequency, and uh, are black, gray, and white. And one can, one can use this as a basis set for natural images. And one can also use this to drive neurons. So one can again, measure the projections of the responses onto this basis set and, and characterize neurons as if they were linear. Uh, and then one could try to put those responses together to, to predict the responses to more complex stimuli, i.e. natural scenes, and ask whether even some nonlinear model based on them uh, would work as well. So when he, when he does this with a typical V1 neuron, he finds that, there are, that a V1 neuron will respond to wavelets that tend to have a particular localization in space and a particular orientation, not so surprisingly, and suppressed by other wavelengths. When go to V2, one finds the same thing. It's just that you may have a bit more of the suppressive wavelets and a bit more diverse set of orientations. So he, so this is, these are example neurons. He had a very large population, which enabled him to cluster neurons into, uh, uh, on the basis of their, their responses to wavelets. And he found that the dominant clusters uh, did correlate with what was in V1 and what was in V2. So you can see kind of this major dichotomy. The first branch is primarily V2 and the second branch is pri primarily V1, but there's an awful lot of mixing. So there wasn't a dichotomous difference between V1 and V2. In fact, there was really uh, a great deal of overlap, but the overall impression was inhibition and inhibition from different orientations was relatively more, uh, this is a typo, was relatively more important in V2 
uh, in V2s and in V1. Um, so, as I mentioned, he used this basis set for two reasons. One is he could use it to drive V1 and V2 neurons rigorously and compare them, but also he could use them to see whether he could model the responses to natural stimuli. And this, I think, was, was one, of the more, uh, one of the most important uh, findings of the work was that his best model, which included nonlinearities, only accounted for 40% of the variance in V1 or 30% of the variance in V2. So the best model is a bad model. Um, one can find differences between V1 and V2, but they tend to be more, qu more quantitative and, and, and blurry and overlapping than, than dichotomous. Um, we found the same thing with, uh, with Hermit functions. As I had mentioned before, uh, in V1, a quarter of the neurons were approximately linear by this test, and the other three quarters had, had major changes of what the filters looked like, depending on what basis set we used. In V2, um, basically just more of the same thing. Only a small fraction of neurons uh, behaved in an approximately linear way, and more of them were nonlinear, but not, not in any qualitatively different way. Um, so we're still, you know, the anatomy suggests that there should be qualitative changes in responses, uh, and, and these two experiments didn't show any. Um, I just want to take a look at a couple and a couple other examples which kind of seemed promising and then turned out not to be. Um, and the first falls into the category of intuitive stimuli. So here's an interesting, um, excuse me, here's an interesting visual phenomenon. I think most of us will see a, an outline of a rectangle up here on the left, uh, even though there are no actual lines that form the edge of those rectangles. And you will see sort of a curved contour here, but there's nothing actually curved. They're just the ends of lines. And here, uh, we're kind of trying to extract this down to its bare bones. One sees a what looks like a partition between the left and the right region uh, and the vertical contour like this, although there's, there's, no, there's no physical contour actually present. So this is a very well-known uh, visual phenomenon, and it goes by the name of illusory contours. And one would expect that at some level in the, in the nervous system, neurons would express this. So in particular, if a neuron was signaling orientation, then a neuron that signaled orientation and knew about illusory contours would respond to this contour. So, so uh, or put another way, that you could test whether a neuron knew about illusory contours by asking, was, what is its orientation preference for this stimulus? Is it, or, did its orientation preference depend on the illusory contour or on the real contour? And those are, since those are at right angles, it allows for a very sharp test. So in V1, in, in primary visual cortex, uh, in, in this study, uh, the typical neuron responded to illusory contours with, a, with an orientation tuning at this particular orientation but responded to real contours with an orientation tuning at this orientation. So this, this neuron, even though, this, even though we perceive this stimulus as having a vertical orientation, the V1 neuron was only responding to the physical bars in it. So its orientation preference for this illusory contour was driven by not the illusory contour itself, but just by the, just by the actual bars. What was interesting is that when one goes to V2, one finds the opposite. So here's a V2 neuron, and its orientation preference for the illusory contour matched the orientation preference for a real bar in the same orientation. So we can kind of infer that this V2 neuron knew about, was, was responding to the illusory contour. And that looks really like a, 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 a qualitative difference between V1 and V2. And it is a nonlinearity in that one can think of an illusory contour, uh, in this case, this horizontal contour as being a difference between two long contours in the same direction. So here we would have a, a response at the horizontal orientation, but in each of these cases, we would expect the response at the vertical orientation. So Peter Hans and, and van der Heide demonstrated this, that neurons that cared about illusory contours really did have the spatial nonlinearity. And they proposed a model in which subunits interacted, I'm not gonna go through the details of the model, to, to generate the response to the illusory contour, and that this was a hallmark difference between V2 and V1. Um, 
The only problem is that if one goes back to V1 and simply changes the size of the stimulus, one can find illusory counter responses in V1 also. One doesn't find as many, uh, but one does find them. So, so when it's again backed into the corner that, um, that the V2 versus V1 difference is, is kind of subtle and qualitative uh, and quantitative, not, 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 a, not, a dichot not, not a dichotomous difference. Um, uh, let me just give, give a, couple, a couple more examples. So here is another mapping strategy for, uh, that, that was used by uh, Ozawa's group um, in, which they, in which the stimuli were two-dimensional noise, but they reverse correlated not only against the pixels, but also against the, the, the local spectra. And so this enabled them to map uh, a local orientation and space, uh, local orientation tuning within receptive fields. And they found that um, you, you, could, you could describe a V2 neuron by its local orientation tuning. In some cases, the local orientation tuning throughout the receptive field was homogeneous. In other cases, it was a bit more scattered. Um, and, and, uh, but, but again, this was a, a quantitative difference, not a qualitative one, in that you, you could also find V1 neurons in both of these categories too. It was just that V2, more of the neurons, um, more of the neurons had responses to multiple different orientations uh, within the receptive field. Um, uh, one can also look at this kind of phenomenon in a dynamic sense, and this is just how, let me, let me uh, because of time, let me just um, skip to the results here. Um, that one could look at interactions between patches of, of orientations in different parts of the receptive fields. And one found in V2 that there were interactions across, uh, across the preferred axis that were not present in V1, but this was, a, this was a very minor part of the overall response. So if you work really hard, you can find differences between V2 and V1, but you have to work a lot harder than you would expect um, than you'd expect based on the, these dramatic differences in the physiology. So I have another uh, sort of both physiologic and perceptual set of experiments I want to talk, at, talk about at, for the very last part. But, but before going there, um, I just want to say something about what, what, what all this may mean. So um, one is unfortunately driven to the viewpoint, I think, that anatomical compartments don't have as much functional significance as one would expect. Um, and I've shown you pictures of mappings uh, of, the, of modalities like orientation and color in, in, in the macaque. Uh, but if one looks across species, and you know, if we want to generalize from macaque to us, we need to think about what makes sense across species in general. One finds that there's, that there's really um, a disappointing lack of correspondence. Um, in V1, in mice, for example, there are orientation to neurons, but one doesn't find these orientation domains. In cats, who have very little color vision, they still have what we call in primates the color blobs. In, in, in monkeys, there are differences between tuning properties of cells at the, at the pinwheel centers that they tend to be more color sensitive, but they're relatively subtle. And they are overall population differences, and the variations within the population are as large as the variations between, uh, between the color blobs and the non blobs. And, and as we saw in V2, there are these dramatic differences in how in, 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 the, in, in the topography, but you have to work very hard to find differences in, in physiology between V1 and V2. So this led to a viewpoint that I think is, 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 is worth emphasizing and may turn out to be truer than, than one expects and was, was proposed quite a few years ago, but has gained very little currency. And, and again, because I, I, I know I'm speaking to people who are thinking about what we can learn from biological vision and extract uh, into uh, machine vision architect, architecture. So what Bullier and Nowak pr proposed was that the folding of the brain, where V1 folds, where there's a fold between V1 and V2, and corresponding parts of the visual field in V1 and V2 actually line up against each other, means that V1 and V2 acts as a functional unit, that it's really a single 12-layered structure with strong connectivity between corresponding parts of the visual field. And so we should, we should think of, it, it's not just that the idea of feed forward from V1 to V2 is wrong, or 
not even that there's massive feedback from V2 to V1, but that the main connections are between the 12 layers of V1 and V2 considered all together. Uh, and in fact, these are faster than lateral connections either between V1, either within V1 or within V2. So I'm not, I'm not claiming that this is actually right. I'm just claiming that one should maintain an open mind about what what kind of lessons, uh, what kind of lessons to learn. Excuse me. So I want I want to spend the last few minutes talking about another set of experiments. Again, uh, kind of fairly superficially and somewhat in the same theme that V1 and V2 are more more quantitatively different than qualitatively different, but also one that I think has has another uh, possible lesson for um, thinking about what we can what we can draw from visual cortical architecture to, uh, uh, for, as far as lessons about, about machine vision. So what we decided to do was to look explicitly at high order, high order spatial nonlinearities in V1 and V2. So just to explain what the experiment is, these are different kinds of black and white images. And hopefully, uh, we'll all agree that there's some spatially, there's some visually obvious spatial patterns uh, in the first four, and that these are highly non-random. The one on the right is very random. If you look very carefully, perhaps you can see some non-randomness in in the fifth and the sixth one, um, but but they're not nearly as salient as the first four. So what these icons underneath, they indicate the kinds of spatial correlations. Um, so for example, in, in the one on the left, if you choose four pixels in a square-shaped region, there's always an even number of, of those four pixels that are black and an even number that are white. If you choose an even number of pixels in a, this triangular shaped region, then, then they'll either all be white or one will be white and two will be black, and it's the other way around here. These also obey a parity rule, but in a different shape. And as you can see, that this, this shape is very visually unsalient. So this is something that, that's percept that kind of characterizes some of the perceptions of the visual system that we care about these kinds of spatial correlations, um, but, but not these. And now we can ask whether, whether neurons do it. So in V1, we recorded responses from a bunch of neurons, and, and very few of them, had, very few of them uh, distinguished between these different kinds of patterns. In V2, we found lots of neurons uh, that, that, let's say, selectively responded to one, kind of, one, one of these kinds of spatial patterns um, compared to the others. Um, so summarizing the data, we can look at selectivity as a function of time, again, emphasizing dynamics, and V2, especially in the intrinsic layers, dramatic responses, but the responses weren't totally absent in V1 either. So V2 just kind of builds on the same thing. So one point is that V2 builds on the same thing that V1 already has. Another point is that the kinds of spatial patterns that V2 cared about, which is these the, uh, the red, the yellow, and the, the blue, were, were, were these the ones that the visual system find, finds most, most visually salient. So it was kind of satisfying that, that V2 and V1 don't compute all possible spatial correlations, but just the ones that we care about. Um, uh, just a brief word that one can, one can model this, this behavior via a, a recurrent model, and one has a lot of trouble modeling this behavior via, via cascade model. Um, so, but why did we use these stimuli? So we use these stimuli because they also come from a, a kind of a, a systematic approach to, look, to looking at spatial correlations. In particular, you can ask about kind of, of about first order correlations, which is just the amount of black spots compared to white spots. And then you can look at pairwise correlations in different orientations. And then one can look at these three, three point correlations, which were on the previous slide and also these four point correlation. And this is part of a series that ultimately, as, as perhaps you can see, can be used to characterize the correlations in any class of any, any class of images. Now, when we did this, uh, so, so we can measure the perceptual sensitivity to these different correlations. Uh, and the, the purpose of showing you the raw data here is that the observer in the top row had thousands of hours of viewing experience. The, the, the observer in the bottom row, whose data looked essentially the same, had only a few hours of viewing experience. So these are, these are sensitivities that are built into the visual system. We care about uh, uh, difference in dot density. We care about pairwise spatial correlations. We also care about three-point and four-point correlations. And when we look across a, 
a range of subjects, we find a very characteristic pattern of thresholds that you have the lowest thresholds for dot density, the next lowest thresholds for pairwise correlations, the next, sorry, the next lowest thresholds for four-point correlations, and oddly, the thresholds for three-point correlations are, are highest. So, but this is a this is kind of a way of characterizing what our visual system cares about as far as uh, visual texture. So um, now we can ask, is this a good match for the world that we live in? Um, so one can take natural images and one can project them into the same space, and one can determine how important these different kinds of spatial correlations are um, for, for discriminating natural images. And not too surprisingly, pairwise correlations are the most important, but the four, four point correlations are the next most important, and the third and the, and the three point correlations are actually the least important. And this pattern of importance in natural images is a very, very close match for the pattern of, of human perception. So we have this kind of three way match of what's important in natural images uh, and what kinds of correlations are important, what is perceptually available, and what visual cortical neurons do in V1 and especially in V2. So, uh, so we have this detailed matching, which you know, is something that a good engineer who designed the visual system would, 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 would put into place. Um, but when we think about applying this to real world problems, uh, it's interesting to recognize that, that, that there are important image classes that are not natural scenes. Our eyes were built for natural scenes, not, for example, for medical images. Um, and what, what is this, where does this come from? Um, in the natural world, there's usually one source of illumination. Objects tend to be opaque. Images are formed by a little bit by reflection, but mostly by absorption, by occlusion. Medical images, let's say an MRI is formed by a tom tomographic section. So there's no such thing as occlusion. There's no such thing as illumination. There's no such thing as transparency. Uh, a radiograph or a mammogram is formed by transparency. So again, no illumination, no occlusion. So if what you want to do is figure out what is in the image, what is the root source of the image from what are the, what are the local statistics, one needs to recognize that, the spa that, the, that these images will have different kinds of statistical content, and our visual system was built for natural images, not for these. So uh, this raises the possibility that uh, that as beautiful as visual cortex is, and as well-tuned as it is for the natural tests that we have, it may not be well-tuned for all the other things that we want uh, artificial vision systems to do. So that's, this, this is where I want to uh, leave things. I, I apologize if I'm kind of raising more questions and opening up more issues than, than, than answers, but I think it's important that we keep an open mind uh, about all these things. And I, and, I, and I thank you very much for your attention. So again, just to summarize, uh, we can start by thinking of V1 as, as oriented filters, um, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, there are lots of uh, there, there are differences and, and diversity and nonlinearities, which are emphasized in V2 more than V1. Um, we, recurrent models seem to work a lot better than feed forward models, but don't yet work well enough to be, uh, be predictive. And when we take a step back and we ask about what lessons we should learn, we need to think about what our visual system was designed for compared to what a particular machine vision system is, is designed for, which may not be the same thing. So thank, again, thank you, and um, I'm happy to take questions and uh, appreciate your attention.